Hello and welcome to Mental Floss Video. Today we're going to be talking about the 2000s internet, or the aughts internet, whatever you call that decade always sounds weird to me, but we're going back to the days when the internet was slow and the memes were not yet dank. Let's get started. What's the first thing you had to do to use the internet in the early 2000s? Dial up. As some of you will remember, and let me tell you, I do, that might take a while. And it might be loud, like this. So, big question, what does that dial up noise mean. Getting onto the internet via dial-up requires two modems. Your computer has a modem which connects it to a telephone line. And when you dial up, you're dialing into a modem at your internet service provider. That's why the sound starts with a dial tone. The modem needs to ensure that it's on the phone line. But hold that phone because these phone lines are analog, passing signals between computers which are digital. The modems do all of that work for you. The word modem came from two words, modulator and demodulator. The modulating part is when the modem takes digital information, or bits, and turns it into analog signals, like sound waves. Demodulating is doing the opposite, so the tones correspond with data. After you dial your internet service provider, the modems chat with each other about a couple things, it's sort of like machine small talk. There are a few places online that can take you step by step through the whole process, so I'm just gonna give you the gist here. The two modems confirm that they are communicating, then they agree on a protocol, which is basically what technique they'll use to turn those bits into analog signals. And the whole process is called a handshake. How friendly. The modem that receives the call disables something called echo suppression. That's an important function for phone calls with people. It makes it so we don't hear our own voice echoing on the phone. But modems don't need that because they don't deal with the awkward interruptions and pauses of human conversation. Plus, echo suppression could corrupt data. Modems do a ton of other stuff too. They test frequencies, they pick transfer speed. None of the sounds are random. As Alexis Madrigal puts it in The Atlantic, this noise was the analog world being bridged by the digital. Throughout the 2000s, there was a prominent case of file sharing that got very complicated very quickly. Between the years 2003 and 2008, the Recording Industry Association of America sued 18,000 people for file sharing. One of those people was Jamie Thomas Rassett of Brainerd, Minnesota, who allegedly participated in illegal file sharing on Kazaa with the username Terriastar. In 2006, the RIAA filed a lawsuit for Jamie downloading and sharing 1,702 songs on Kazaa, and if she wanted to settle, it would cost her $5,000. She wouldn't pay, maintaining that she hadn't downloaded the files. In 2007, Capitol Records Inc. v. Thomas Rassett was the United States' first file sharing case that was put before a jury. The group of record labels ended up suing her for 24 of the songs they claimed she made available on Kazaa. There were two days of testimony in early October. The lawyers for the record label showed that Jamie had used the username Terriastar multiple times in her life for accounts. They showed that the downloads came from her IP address. There were also some questions about her hard drive, which Jamie replaced in March 2005. The music label lawyers argued that she was getting rid of the evidence of her file sharing. The jury deliberated for four hours and found Jamie liable for copyright infringement. The penalty was $222,000 total. That's $9,250 per song. Soon after, Jamie was granted a new trial by a trial court because basically, the jury in the original case had been given some improperly worded instructions. She ended up losing another case in 2009. This time, the jury ordered her to pay damages of $1.92 million, which the judge lowered to $54,000. Then the RIAA offered Jamie another settlement. She could pay $25,000, which they'd give to a music charity. In exchange, she'd have to ask the judge to remove that decision from the record. In 2010, the case was back in court. A federal jury ordered her to pay $1.5 million, but the judge called that amount so severe and oppressive as to be wholly disproportionate to the offense and obviously unreasonable. He lowered it to $54,000. In 2012, the case was in the U.S. 8th Circuit Court of Appeals in St. Paul, Minnesota. There was a three-judge panel, and they reinstated the first judgment, the $222,000 fine. Finally, in 2013, the Supreme Court refused to review the case, calling the 2012 decision final. As for how she'll come up with the money, Jamie said, there's no way that they can collect. 
Right now, I get energy assistance because I have four kids. It's just the one income. My husband isn't working. It's not possible for them to collect even if they wanted to. I have no assets. If you were on the internet in the 2000s, it's very possible you were using instant messaging, but your younger self might be surprised to learn that IM is not a perfect way of communicating. There may be benefits to hearing human speech over reading messaged words. At least, that's what some researchers learned in their study published in 2012 in the journal Evolution and Human Behavior. They studied an interaction between mothers and daughters. There were 68 total pairs of them in the study. The girls were between the ages of 7 and a half and 12, and they had to complete something known as is the Trier Social Stress Test for Children, which involves doing academic tasks for 15 minutes in front of an audience that only reacts with neutral expressions. The participants were in one of four groups, which changed what they did after the test. In the first, they interacted in person with their mom. The second involved no communication with their mom. In the third, they spoke with their mothers over the phone. And in the fourth, they instant messaged with mom on a computer. In all of the three groups that involved parental interaction, the moms were told to be emotionally supportive. The study also involved measuring hormones. The researchers looked at cortisol, which increases after something stressful, like the Trier test. And they also looked at oxytocin, which is connected with good relationships. They took baseline samples before anything happened, and then samples afterwards so they could compare all the levels. The researchers found that girls had higher levels of cortisol in the instant message group, as well as the no parental interaction group. On the other hand, the girls who talked to their moms in person or on the phone had comparatively low cortisol levels. Those latter two groups also had higher oxytocin levels. Basically, there was less evidence of stress in the kids that got to hear their mom's voice. The authors concluded that the comforting sound of a familiar voice is responsible for the hormonal differences observed. As for why, they had a couple theories. Like, maybe written language just can't affect hormones the way a human voice can? Or these girls maybe were less used to instant messaging with parents, so it wasn't a preferred method of communication. Oh, the aughts when we used to hear human voices. I remember the first time I ever saw a text message, I said to the person who sent it, why did you do that? You could have just called me. And now I haven't made a phone call in like nine months. One of the most popular websites during the 2000s was Neopets. Users would take care of cartoon pets, explore the world of Neopia, play lots of minigames, earn Neo points, and buy virtual items. At one time, Neopets got 2.2 billion page views each month with 25 million site users. One of them was me. Let's talk about how it all began. The creators of Neopets were Adam Powell and Donna Williams. The site launched in November of 1999 while they were students at Nottingham University. Originally, they wanted the users to be the Neopets exploring a world, but that proved too time consuming, so it eventually became about caring for the pets. Initially, their target audience was bored college students, although Donna would later say that it wasn't designed with any demographic in mind. And the site was pretty quirky in its early days, featuring Neopets that weren't even really like pets, like Bruce Forsyth and Macy Gray. Very soon after the debut of Neopets, it was bought by an American, Doug Doring. The first investors brought on board were Scientologists. According to Donna Williams, that was odd for the founders, but it didn't affect the website. In her words, it didn't really change anything that I noticed, apart from some odd test that interviewees had to take consisting of questions like which straight line seemed friendlier and stuff like that. At one time, there was some talk about putting Scientology education on the site, but we killed that idea. The company had some notable incidents over the years. Many accused it of becoming too commercialized, directing tons of advertisements at children. In 2004, a mother in Australia made news, complaining about a Neopets McDonald's cross-promotion. She compared the games within Neopets to gambling, which wasn't too much of a stretch considering they did have poker as well as lottery tickets. And. Kids like me got very addicted. The site even experienced an inflation of its fake currency, Neopoints. With so many users earning points regularly playing games, there were too many Neopoints floating around. The rich only got richer, and people couldn't pull themselves out of their standing as middle-class Neopians. The team working on the site tried to convince users to donate Neopoints in exchange for prizes to help the economy, but many players didn't get on board. As for what happened to the site, in 2005, Viacom bought Neopets 
that's for $160 million. That's when the merchandise began, like stuffed animals and trading cards. Then in 2014, Neopets was purchased yet again, this time by Jumpstart. Neopets is still around, but it's much less popular than it used to be, with fans estimating that active users are in the thousands now. We're gonna end the episode with some quick facts about the 2000s internet. Tom Anderson, AKA your first friend on MySpace, sold his stake in the company in 2005 for $580 million. Congrats, Tom. The character Strong Bad from the popular animations on HomestarRunner.com is actually named after some wrestlers in the NES game Tag Team Wrestling. There was a team in the game called the Strong Bads. In 2013, the guitarist of Queen, Brian May, collaborated with animator John T. Picking on a song called Save the Badger, Badger, Badger. The song remixed Picking's famous 2003 internet video song Badgers, and it was a protest song in response to the UK government's decision to allow badger culling. It hit number Number one on the iTunes rock chart. Sean Carolyn was an early investor in the technology that became Siri, which he eventually helped sell to Apple. In an interview with Forbes, he explained that part of the reason he invested was Smarter Child, a bot that you could instant message with. Carolyn explained, Smarter Child already had 10 million users and was getting a billion messages a day. The market was speaking. I remember that. You guys remember that? That was fun. You may mostly remember the website Zango from your 2000 blogging days, but it's actually still around. In 2014, the lease ended on their server facility and they managed to crowd fund $50,000 to keep the operation going. If you remember Zanga, maybe you'll also recall LiveJournal. Yes! In 2007, the site was sold to a Russian media company, and as of 2015, 80 of Russia's most popular 100 blogs could be found on LiveJournal. Those poor, sad, Russian blogs. The famous end of the world video was created by a man named Jason Windsor. In 2015, over a decade after the video was made, an interviewer asked him whether it had negative consequences. He said, as soon as my mom saw it, she was horrified at all the foul language, but I think she's gotten over that. She hasn't. She's probably still upset about it, just so you know. Speaking of moms and viral videos, Charlie the Unicorn was originally a birthday gift for the creator's mom. His name was Jason Steele, and in an AMA on Reddit, he wrote, I don't think she was very impressed. She liked that I made it for her, but it took a few years before the humor and it started making sense. <laughs> Wikipedia launched in early 2001, and that year they reached 20,000 articles written by users. And for our last numbers of the day, just 11% of Americans used the internet to follow the returns of the November 2004 election. Thanks for watching Mental Floss video, which is made with the help of all of these nice people. Please subscribe to our channel if you want to see more scatterbrained videos, and as they say in my hometown, don't forget to be awesome.